Once God's plan was a mystery hidden from our sight. Now God has disclosed what was kept secret for so so very long. He was brought, he brought it out in the light. In the brighter light on this fourth Sunday in Advent, may we see more clearly the glory of God in Christ and sing of the steadfast love of the Lord forever. With my mouth, I will proclaim your faithfulness to all generations. I declare that your steadfast love is established forever. Your faithfulness is as firm as the heavens. Light four candles, see them glow brightly, so that all may know how four candles show the way making our darkness bright as God's day. Dear God, your faithfulness has been great, leading us to the day of anticipation and celebration. May the glorious light of your steadfast love shining brightly in us through us, and through us, that all may give your praise and glory. In the Savior's name we pray. Amen. Please join me in the call to worship. My soul magnifies the Lord. For God looks with favor on the lowliness of his servants. everyone here on this beautiful Sunday morning and uh, thank you for braving a little bit of the cold and the wind and everything that, uh, that goes with it. Uh, just a, a quick thing I wanted to share with you in our opening hymn this morning, O Come All Ye Faithful, uh, I love the, the beginning of that third verse. It says, Yea, Lord, we greet thee, born this happy morning. Now, if you look at that, you might look at it and just say, well, wait a second, this isn't Christmas. Why would we sing these words? And yet you could sing these words every day when you wake up because you can look at these words and say you know what christ is anew today and he's a new in me so when you th see those words you know you can on july 4th you can sing those words if you want on december 26th you can sing those words if you, you can sing them every day of the week if you wish it's i think it's uh, for, important for us to remember that christ wakes up with us every day and every day is new and he's born anew with us. I wanted to share with you also, uh, we've already heard about uh, Carolyn Goldstein passing away. And after worship, we're going to invite everybody to go over to the fellowship hall, have some refreshments. They look really good, folks, so don't, pick, don't miss out on that. But after everybody gets some refreshments, we're going to take some time and just have an opportunity to sit down and, and just talk a little bit. If you have a story you'd like to share, uh, you know, a minute or two or whatever, uh, to talk about Carolyn, maybe how uh, she impacted your life or, or something uh, about her that you'd like to talk about, you know, have a minute or two to do that. We'll, we'll, we'll have some time after everybody gets some refreshments to sit down and do that. So again, after our service, so, uh, go over to the fellowship hall, have a refreshment or so, and then we'll, we'll gather and, and sit down and have a chance to, to visit uh, in, in that manner, if that's okay with you. Let's open with a word of prayer. Yes, Lord, we greet you on this beautiful morning. We thank you for calling us together to allow us to, to worship, to worship a resurrected Christ who raises every morning in our lives and in our hearts. So may our hearts be filled on this Sunday morning, this fourth Sunday of Advent, before we, before we get ready to truly celebrate Jesus' birth. Help us to see a new light and new life in all that we do. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. I'm going to invite our children to come up. We've got some special time for y'all. Howdy. Y'all are ready, aren't you? You're ready for Christmas. Yeah. Have you been drinking coffee like I have? It keeps me awake, doesn't it? Yeah. Okay, y'all know what this is, right? What is it? It's a cell phone. Yeah. Do you have one yet? 
<laughs> you have one yet? No, you don't need them yet, right? Okay, well, on this cell phone, this is like really cool because I've got a picture. So I go to the galleries and I've got this picture. Now, what's that a picture of? A Christmas tree. It's a Christmas tree, yes it is. But it's really kind of tough to tell all the stuff on it, isn't it? Unless you expand the picture. That's called to magnify the picture. So, ooh, what's that? A cane. That's a candy cane, yeah. Now this is really cool. What's that? A house. It's a church, yeah, it's like, it's a building. Yeah, it's got a light in it and everything else. Did you know that over in the other building, there's a table with all these churches that, that they, well, they'll plug it in later on and they have all these lights in them. It's really kind of cool. We were looking at it earlier this morning. But you see, when you expand the picture, you make it larger, you're magnifying it and you can see all the things. Now this, this is my wife does. She likes these angels. So she puts angels all over her, our tree. Uh, and so, you know, when you look at it, it's like, wow, that's pretty cool. You can see all sorts of different stuff as you work your way around. See, that's a rocking horse. Can you see that? See, now when the tree, tree's real small, like that, you can't see that rocking horse. But when you magnify it, you make it bigger, Oh, you can see all sorts of really neat stuff in there. See? So anyway, this morning in our bulletin, we said, the Lord magnifies my soul. So what, what, what Mary, this is a young girl who's really excited because she's found out that, that her baby's going to be special. Like your mama did when, when they knew you were coming around. They knew their babies were going to be special. You're special, aren't you? Yeah, you're special, aren't you? They're special, aren't they? Yeah. Grandma and Grandpa. Yeah, okay. Mom and dad are in, but yeah, grandparents. Do you know why grandparents and grandkids get along so well? Because there's no rules. No, <laughs> no we, we can talk about family counseling later. <laughs> but the reason that grandparents and grandchildren get along so well is because they have mutual enemy. <laughs> uh, that's why there's no rules. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, moving. when they said it magnifies, it makes it bigger. So this Mary, she said, you know, my, the, this magnifies my soul. It makes it bigger. And so what she's able to do is because her baby is going to be so special, she's going to be able to let everybody know how wonderful this baby's going to be. Just like before you were born, your mom and dad told everybody and your grandparents told everybody how wonderful <coughs> you're going to be. Are you going to be wonderful? Are you going to be wonderful? Uh I don't doubt it for a second. But when we talk about magnifying our soul, it makes it easier to see. So she made it easier to see how God is working in her life. So every day, you let people see that God is working in your life too, okay? Yeah, let's pray. Dear God, you magnify our soul with the beauty of life and the wonderment of love. So thank you, Lord, as we get ready for Christmas. Help us always to remember that, that it's about Jesus Christ and, and how he loves us. And help us to love other people too. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks for coming up. We'll see you. You going to go for refreshments later? Yeah, you too. I'll be there. All right. Please stand for our next hymn, A Little Time of Bethlehem, number 178.
Let's say together our words of common confession is found, they can be found in your hymnal on 137, though I think most of us know the words already, the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The words of Scripture this morning come to us from Luke's Gospel, the first chapter, starting at verse 39. In those days, Mary set out and went with haste to a Judean town in the hill country, where she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. Now, when Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the child leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit and exclaimed with a loud crawl, with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why has this happened to me, that the mother of my Lord comes to me? For as soon as I heard the sound of your greeting, the child in my womb leaped for joy. And blessed is one who believed that there would be fulfillment of what was spoken to her by the Lord. This is the word of the Lord given to God's people. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty and gracious God, we give you thanks for these words. Words of hope and life and assurance. Assurance that regardless of the circumstances in our lives, you still love us. You care about us. You care for us. And so I ask now, Almighty God, as I proclaim your word, that the words that I speak won't be my words, but that your words that they touch our minds and that they touch our hearts. And that the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be pleasing in your sight. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Each and every one of us lives in two worlds. We, we, we have two different existences. And, and one of them is that ideal world. It's that world, it's kind of that spiritual world where, where we look at things through, through our, our set of ethics and morals and the things we've been taught, be it through the church or our family, and, and we look at the world as it, as it should be. But then we also live in the real world, the world the way it is that exists around us, despite what we would see 
compared to what really is going on. Let me give you some examples. Uh, in an ideal world, we would live with peace and harmony. But in the real world, we live with war and rumors of war and discord. In an ideal world, uh, we would have love and faith. But in the real world, we're surrounded by hate and confusion. In the ideal world, we would experience absolute joy with living. And yet, so often in the real world, we're surrounded by sorrow. In, in the ideal world, we, we, there would be generosity and kindness. And yet in the, in the real world, we see greed and so often apathy. In the ideal world, we would experience justice and hope. But so often in the real world, there is injustice and despair. Now, we live in a world, actually, actually, we live in a world where all of these do come together and, and they all do exist. And, 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 they, and that's sometimes what the tension of life is all about, where, where, where these two worlds are, are constantly in, in battle with each other. But there's some points in, in time when these worlds just actually come together and form a way of living for all of us. Now, I, I, I want to share with you, there's a woman, uh, <coughs> she has a Twitter handle. How many of you tweet our Twitterers? I'm not, but nobody? You all know what Twitter is. You've heard of it, right? Okay. So if you, yeah, I know some people are kind of afraid of raising their hands. You know, oh, well, you know. Uh, no, I'm not going to ask for money. I'm not going to ask you to volunteer or anything. But, but you know, uh, but, but there's this Twitter handle. It's called Mommy Owl. And she posted this conversation she had with her seven-year-old child. The child said, I wish I could see Santa's naughty list. And the mom replied, hmm, to see if you're on it. And the seven-year-old responded, now, to see who I could have the most fun with. Ooh. Now, think of the sympathy we have to have for the mom of that child. Now, more proof of the theory is that kids' priorities sometimes at Christmas are, are a little different than their parents. There's some letters to Santa Claus the kids wrote. One is when you come to my house, there are going to be cookies for you. But if you're real hungry, you can use our phone and order a pizza to go. <laughs> Dear Santa, I want a puppy. I want a playhouse. Thank you. I've been good most of the time. Sometimes I'm wild. Then there's this four-year-old wrote to Santa. Dear Santa, I'll take anything because I haven't been that good. <laughs> how, how many children would have hit that? Okay. Uh, now, I've got some news for you. It doesn't matter if you've been good this year or not. It helps if you have. But Jesus still comes for you. Jesus came into the world for each and every one of us. Because each and every one of us is a saint. And each and every one of us falls short of being a saint. Except for maybe Corey. <laughs> Want to make sure you're still with us? Yeah, she's still with us. She's just shaking her head. Okay. But, you know, there, there's, there's those times when we look at it and say, you know, did Jesus really come for me? And the answer is yes. Followed by yes. Followed by another <coughs> resounding yes. And Jesus came for us, not because we're good or deserving, but because God loves us and wants us to find that way to live our lives and to live our lives well. Now, there's times in history where, where, where the ideal life and the real life actually intersect. Uh, and, 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 and we can think of times like that. In the Bible, we may remember that, that, that uh, Israel were slaves to Egypt. And Moses comes along. And he leads the people, by God's guidance, leads the people out of Egypt, moving them to a new land, a land of milk and honey. But we find out that the people along the way are becoming despondent about, you know, where is God? And, and we're hungry and we need these types of things and, 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 and everything. And so what, what happens is Moses goes up on, on Mount Sinai. When he comes down, he comes down with, with the Ten Commandments. So this is, this is God's way of intersecting with his people. 
And, and so, so we've got this, this ideal life, the way God wants us to live, and he provides that in ten very simple commandments. How many of you remember the Ten Commandments? Yeah. Recite them. Ah, I got you. Okay. I know some of you probably could, and that would be great. But, but remember the first four commandments. God is telling us quickly and easily how God wants us to relate to God. And then we've got the next six, okay, uh, six through ten, or I'm sorry, five through ten, are telling us how God wants us to be in relationship with each other. And so God has intersected with humankind to give us, to give us that, that idea of, of what really works in our dealing with God and our dealing with, each, and our dealing with each other. Well, then, you know, of course, we've got Israel. They've got these commandments. You think, wow, this is going to be incredible. Things are going to go smoothly now. But then suddenly we end up with 613 laws. And we end up with, instead of, uh, instead of judges there to help us figure out what's going on co uh, co concerning these Ten Commandments, we now are filled with people who want a king. And when you have kings, you now have developed a, a, a class system where you have people who, who, who the haves and the have-nots. And the distance between them is getting farther and farther apart. And the people who are poor, the people who are in need, are just being trampled on and run over by, by those who are rich and powerful and, and, and wealthy. And, 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 and it's both the, 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 the political leaders as well as the religious leaders. And so God, God once again intersects with humankind. And he intersects with humankind by sending prophets to let people know, wait a second. You're making some serious, serious mistakes. There's some things you need to be aware of, and there's some things you need to do. God has this vision for us, but we're way down here. So we have to close that gap. And Israel goes through, through being conquered. It goes through, through exile. It goes through all of these terrible things that, uh, uh, in, in their history. But then they're finally allowed to come together. But just as quickly as they're united, once again, they get in their own way. And God finally just says, okay, I think I'm going to come and show them what I expect. So he, 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 he empties himself and becomes a human being. And he comes and he lives. The word of God is made flesh and dwells among us. You're going to hear that Christmas Eve, I guarantee you. Because that is the message of Christmas. The Word was made flesh and lived among us. But Christmas itself has a lot of intersections between God's ideal world and our world. Some of those intersections include when the angel comes to Zechariah and Elizabeth. People who, you know, Zechariah is a priest. And, 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 and his wife Elizabeth, and, and they've been around a long time. They're beyond childbearing years. And the angel comes in Luke and says, hey, have I got news for you? You're going to have a baby. And Elizabeth is saying, yeah, right. I'm kind of past that. Don't worry about it. God's going to take care of it. And then we find out in Luke again, an, an angel comes and talks to Mary. 13 to 16 year old child, teenager, young, betrothed but not married. And, and this angel comes and says, you're going to have a baby. And she says, oh, well, wait a second. We got to talk about this. There's a lot of problems we have to do. See, you've got, see, God's got this ideal. But Mary has to deal with the real world. She has to deal with a future potential husband. She has to deal with parents, family. She's got to deal with neighbors. She's got to deal with all of these different things. And, and the angel said, don't worry about it. We got this thing covered. It's going to be fine. So she breaks it to Joseph, who took it quite well, until an angel comes to him and says, you know what, Joseph? It's okay. You can still marry her. You can still have this child. You, you don't have to abandon her. You don't have to, to, to uh, expose her before the community. You don't have to have her stoned. You don't have to send her back to her family. Instead, there is a plan for this child. It's going to be okay. And so we see these intersections of the ideal, what God wants for humankind, and some of the issues, some of the pressures that, that humankind is stuck having to go through. And then, of course, we now have uh, uh, the, uh, uh, Elizabeth in Luke, 
and Mary coming together. They're relatives. And Mary is looking for someone who, who, who's just going to have some sort of understanding of what she's going through. And so uh, Mary is seeking somebody who gets it, even though they're under totally different circumstances. And, and I've been told, I've never been pregnant, okay? But I've been told that no, no two pregnancies are the same. <coughs> Women go through different things. Some it's an easier to, uh, time than others, and, 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 and so there's a lot of different challenges that go on with every pregnancy. But the one thing I have also noticed is, is I mean, we were in the service when Gwen was having our children, when Gwen and I were having our children. She, of course, went through the labor and delivery and all that goes with it. You figured that out. But is, is there were so many other spouses who were pregnant at the time. So they could get together, they could talk, and, that, and that's what's going on with Mary. Here we've got this young girl with very limited experience to the world, going to someone who has more experience, but the one thing they have in common is they are both pregnant with children. And so she wants to be with somebody who gets it. And the meeting provides us with some lessons, some, some things we can learn. There's some things we can take away from this whole thing. The first lesson we learn in this text today and, and through the story and, and through the entire story leading up to Christmas is that God is working in the small things in the universe. God works through those small things. Listen to this. In Micah, the prophet Micah, but you, O Bethlehem of Ephrathah, who are one of the little clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to rule in Israel, whose origin is from of old, from ancient days. Therefore, he shall give them up until the time when she who is in labor has brought forth. Then the rest of the kindred shall return to the people of Israel, and he shall stand and feed his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they shall live secure for now, he shall be great to the ends of the earth, and he shall be the one of peace. God takes the smallest of the clans and says, from you, the greatest of all will come. To me, that's pretty exciting stuff. And, and, and here, I love this. Isaiah chapter 6, I'm sorry, chapter 11, verse 6 says this. This, this is beautiful. The wolf, this is a time now when, when, when you know, uh, fulfilling what Isaiah's talking about, or, or, or what Micah's talking about. The wolf will live with the lamb, the leopard will lie down with the goat, the calf and the lion and yearling together, and a little child will lead them. The time of peace and the time of harmony will come. Not through some grand, explosive, magnificent, spectacular extravaganza, but through a child, a little child. Now, anybody here who's had children understands that children rule the roost, don't they? Oh, you're smiling. I know you know what I'm talking about. Because when that child comes into the world as small, and as helpless and as delicate as they are, with the needs that they have, with the dependency that they have upon us, we all know that we do everything we can to ensure that that little bundle of joy is loved and nurtured and cared for. And so we go through life looking at these things and, and say, you know, it's, it's those small things in life that make it possible. So, so we have, what we find out is that God is working in the small things of the universe. And that's really the message of Christmas, that God, the almighty creator, the great I am, set aside his own majesty, his own authority to be born as a tiny baby to a poor young couple. Now, he could have come as a conquering hero. He could have come as a charismatic king. He could have come as a commanding emperor. Instead, instead, God came as a helpless baby to show us that God loves us enough to enter into our daily lives. He became like us to become one of us. 
In the birth of Jesus, God wrapped himself into, in, into the unexpected. And it's easy to miss the joy of Christmas because we're looking for that big moment. How many of you watch Hallmark movies? Anybody? It's okay to admit it. Yeah. They had 41 Christmas movies this year. I said to Gwen, I think we have five or six left. We've seen them all. And they all have some extravaganza. And it's usually around lighting a Christmas tree. And I, I get intrigued by when, by when they start the countdown to light the tree. Because sometimes they start at 10. When will they get this over with? Sometimes they start at 3. Yay, they're getting this over with. But then they light the tree. And then there's always the person who goes, oh, that big extravagant moment. The lights go on and, and, and the angels are glowing and, and, and everything's happening. But, but that's not how God worked it. Instead, God puts the whole thing together in a little town amongst poor people. As a baby, he comes into that world. But we're all looking for that big moment, the big gift, the pageantry, the decorations, the lights, the flashing worship services. But the actual Christmas stories, it's almost entirely composed of little <coughs> private moments of joy when God shared the message of the coming Messiah with a humble, poor nobodies like the shepherds, and like you, and like me. You see, there's this old saying. It says, if you watch the pennies, then the dollars will take care of themselves. If we take care of the little things, we focus and pay attention to those little things in life, those little moments, then we find out that those little moments can become the biggest memories for in life. So that's the first thing we, we learned is that, is that God is working in the small things. The next thing we find out is that God is working in difficult circumstances. I told you the circumstances Elizabeth was dealing with being past a childbearing age, but now suddenly going to have a child. I told you some of the challenges that, that Mary would have, that, that, that Joseph would have. But, but these difficult circumstances are what would make it possible for God's light to truly shine through. You see, God never chooses the easiest path to accomplish his will because it is in our weakness that God's strength comes out. It is, it is in our darkness that God's light is able to shine even brighter. God's light shines in the darkness and God's power is greatest in our weakness and God's grace shows up when we least expect it but when we most greatly need it. So most people uh, uh, inherently understand to pray during difficult times. But imagine if instead of just praying in difficult times, you know, times of war, time of natural disasters, times of poor health, times of family uh, problems, time of mass uh, shootings, times of financial problems, imagine, just imagine what can happen when people remember prayer in those good times. Imagine how the world can change that with that attitude of gratitude. The God who is with us in the valley is that same God who's with us on the mountaintop. But we only seem to, to, to worry about God when, when we're in the valley and we're in worries ourselves. Instead of just saying, wow, God, thank you. Anybody here, here ever watch the TV program Young Rock? You know who Rock is? Yeah, okay. Uh, Dwayne Johnson. This past week was, was great. It was season 2, episode 1. He's talking about the worst Christmases ever. And so you have Young Rock at age 10, and, and then Young Rock at age 15 comes to him and says, it's going to be the worst Christmas ever. And tells him why. And then there's Young Rock uh, at, at, uh, at 21 comes to him and says, well, you, you know, you think 15 was bad. Wait till you get to 21. So, so there's all these, it, it, it's kind of like a, a, a take off on Dickens Christmas Carol, you know, these, these, these young rock of past and future and present and all that kind of stuff. But what ends up happening is, is they end up meeting rock of today and he says, you know, it's all about your attitude. So if you go back and look at that first Christmas that, that when you were 10 and are excited about the gift you got, even though it wasn't exactly what you wanted, if you're excited about that gift, think of how that will change your perspective in the future. And that's how it is with prayer. See, prayer doesn't just change our, our mindset when times are tough. They help us to maintain a proper mindset 
when times are good as well. Because again, the God who is with us in the valley is the same God who's with us on the mountain. So, so we, we find that God is working in the small things. We find that, the, uh, that, that God is working in the difficult circumstances. But we also find out that God is working in everyone who opens our hearts to him. There's this great meditation mantra. It says, let go, let God. And that's kind of, a, that, that's about trust. It's about having faith. And, and you all know the definition of faith, right? It's in the Bible. I think Paul tells us to, you know, it's belief in things not yet seen. That's what faith is. Because if you've seen it, you don't need faith because you've got empirical evidence. But it's, it's belief in things not yet seen. So we have to be willing to open ourselves up to let go of, of our ego, to let go of our personal needs, our personal desires, and just say, God, it is in your hands. Do with me as you choose. It's about going to the one who created the heavens and the earth, who created us, who knows everything. Everything about us, every thought in our minds, every challenge in our lives, every hair on our head. God knows each and every one of those. So here's Mary. She's a pregnant teen. She goes to Elizabeth, who's also pregnant. She's looking for someone who gets it. And as soon as Mary greets Elizabeth, the child in her womb leaps for joy, and Elizabeth is filled with the Holy Spirit, and she blesses Mary, and suddenly, Mary gets it. And what does Mary say? She says, my soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has looked with favor on the lowliness of his servant. And surely from now on, all generations will call me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me, and holy is his name. Wow. Mary becomes someone who gets it. Now, I know, I know you guys have, uh, guys and gals here had the upper room. And, and I was intrigued on Wednesday when I read uh, uh, the upper room. It's called, it was entitled Trapped in the Airport. Now, Leland uh, uh, Gamison from Indiana tells this story. He says, we're calling because we need your prayers, Pastor. We are trapped between flights in Chicago because of a snowstorm. If you were trapped at an airport because of a snowstorm, how many of you would call a pastor? I mean, you can call me, it's fine. You can call Glenn if you want. But they're calling because they're caught, they're, they're, they're trapped. And so the pastor asked some questions. Uh, he brought, brought, brought this thing into perspective and reality. He said, are you inside where it's dry and climate control? And I said, yes. So then he said, do you have access to water and food? And again, Leland said, yes. So then he asked, are you sick? Well, no. So then the pastor says to Leland, he said, then you aren't really trapped, are you? I'll pray for you to be of service in the Lord where you are. So Leland and his pastor prayed together, and his attitude changed almost immediately. He bought children's books at an airport store, offered them to the families with children. His wife struck up a conversation with an older woman wearing a Korean War veteran's hat. Later, they offered to wait in food line for others, and it became easy for them to approach others, knowing that they were all in the same situation. And additionally, several worried-looking, stranded passengers accepted their offer to pray with them. The 16 hours... In the, ter in the terminal, the airport terminal, went rather quickly when they made, when he says, when we made ourselves available to others. We were not trapped. We were in the right place at the right time to reflect the love of God. Wow. They were in what most people would consider difficult circumstances, but God was at work. They were at a time when they, they opened up their hearts. But God 
was at work. And they were at a time when small things, getting books for children, saying a prayer with someone, standing in line so in a food line so someone could go to another line or go to a restroom or, or take care of family. All those little small things. God was at work. And handling the little things for others, that ended up making a big difference, not just for Leland and his family, but for everyone. Going and talking to his pastor, having things put in perspective for him, allowed him to be someone who gets it. Well, this is the word of the Lord given to God's people. Thanks be to God. Amen. Pray with me, if you will. Gracious God, you are one of such infinite tenderness and constant faithfulness. You give us longer nights, a gentle chill, and this special time of of Advent, a, a, a time of waiting, a time of hoping, a time of longing, and a time of dreaming. And like Mary, each and every one of us feels something stir within us, a sense of wonder as we look out at a starlit sky, a feeling of love for our families, a twinge of joy as we find the gift that expresses our deepest appreciation. A little panic sometimes as we recall all that needs to be done. And a sudden <coughs> stillness when we sense your divine presence. Oh God, help us to be attentive to the rise of hope within us which bids us to action in your service. We pray these things in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray and to pray together often. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. As we take a moment to breathe in, a deep breath of fresh and new air. We're reminded that with each, with each breath, new life is breathed into our lungs. Just as God breathed into that first human being, just as the Spirit of God breathed into his followers at Pentecost, we breathe that new air and we are refreshed and we are renewed to be at peace. Amen. Y'all are in for a treat. I get the opportunity on a Sunday morning to go over to, to hear the choir uh, rehearse. It's going to be good. <laughs> Thank you. 
some of what the Lord has provided us.
be with you in those small moments and help make them to be great memories. May the God of love and life be with you in those challenging circumstances to show you that his light can shine even in the darkness. And may the God of life be with you now and always. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And I wish you all Merry Christmas and God bless. Amen. Mm -hmm.